And I really appreciate everybody being here today. I'm Corey Wilder. I'm a scholarly assistant professor and the marketing director at Murrow College of Communication. Um, today, you're joining us at our very first Power of Voice. It is a series that celebrates how we express our unique style, personality, experience, and opinion by using our voices. At their worst, our voices disseminate misinformation, disinformation, and hate. And at their best, we can use our voices to break down systemic barriers and open doors that may otherwise remain locked. Today's panel features graduates of Murrow College who have interacted with the Black Lives Matter movement. This conversation will, we hope, serve as a catalyst to engage community in discussions and dialogues surrounding diversity, equity, inclusion, race, and social justice issues. Feel free to ask questions using the chat box as you think of them. We will be monitoring it throughout the discussion and we will refer to your questions during the Q&A session at the end. I am thrilled to introduce you today to our moderator for this event. Erin Thompson is a scholarly assistant professor with Murrow College. She's also the course director for public speaking in the digital age and teaches reasoning and writing and crisis communication courses. She is actively involved with Eventers for Equality, advocating for Black Lives Matter within the horse community. Thank you for the introduction, Corey, and thank you to everybody for joining us today. I'm very excited for this panel discussion and very honored to be asked to moderate it. When I think about the panelists, it what comes to mind is a phrase that we use often in the Murrow College, which is Murrow in action. And to me, our panelists today really exemplify what Murrow in action is. They are out in our communities doing really outstanding and inspiring work. They have some very interesting expertise and experiences to share with you today. And just to give you an overview of how we're gonna run things, we'll start off by having each panelist introduce themselves so you get a little bit of a sense of who they are early in the discussion. And then we'll proceed through some questions and conversations. As Corey mentioned, we will work to monitor the chat. So as you have questions, go ahead and type those in before you forget what they are. We'll save the audience questions though until the end. And then we'll uh, hear from you and let you have a chance to ask questions of our panelists today. But mainly we will keep the spotlight on them and have a chance for them to speak with you about their expertise, their journey through equity and working for social change and justice and advocacy from several different perspectives. So with that, I wanna turn things over to the panelists and we'll have Nashika start us off today by telling us where you currently live and work and then just a brief overview of some of the work that you've been doing in your communities to move equity forward. Yeah. Hi, my name is Nashika Stambro, and I am a public information specialist for Community Transit. And we are a public um, transit authority in Snohomish County. And so I live and work in Everett uh, within Snohomish County. I, um, let's see, when thinking about 2020 and what I've been doing as far as moving equity forward, specifically racial equity. I think uh, about how I can support the community and I've been you know, trying to serve on community boards, listen to community listening sessions and to help the youth in the community. So those are some of the ways that I'm working to move racial equity forward, but I'm also doing a lot within my agency. Catherine, would you go ahead and give us a similar introduction? Hi, my name is Catherine Barner. I'm a producer with KH2 Local News in Spokane, Washington. I produce the 5 and 6 p.m. newscast on Saturdays and Sundays, and in three days out of the weeks, I work on the assignment desk and write for digital. Uh, being the weekend producer has been uh, a lot of protest, has been very much protest coverage of what's going on in our community. Um, so almost every weekend since May 31st, we've had a protest of sorts. And it's been very interesting to figure out how to uh, properly show what these protests are saying and how to make sure we're doing it objectively and not taking sides on that. So I currently live in Spokane and then I graduated from WSU in 2019 with a degree in strategic communication. Fantastic. Yeah, we will come to that topic of reporting objectively in this kind of climate a little bit further on in the conversation. So that's great. Uh, let's hear from Leticia. Would you introduce yourself, please? Hi, um, 
My name is Leticia Jensen. I graduated from Washington State University in 2019 um, with a degree in journalism and media production and a major in Spanish. And a, a year after graduating, I got a position at Willamette Week newspaper in Portland. Um, and as I'm sure most of you know, Portland's kind of been a national focus for protests. We're reaching about like 150 days um, of consecutive protests. And my beat is, is covering um, East Portland. So East of 82nd, it's where a large concentration of immigrants, refugees, people of color, and just low income people have been kind of pushed to the outer edge um, as Portland has gentrified. So um, not only is it covering like the region of East Portland, so east of 82nd, it's also just covering those uh, marginalized communities. Very good. And then finally, Nathan. Yes. Hi, my name is Nathan Howard, uh, class <laughs> of 2015. Um, studied journalism, was at the Daily Evergreen as well while I was at WSU. Since then, I've worked for a number of newspapers in the Pacific Northwest, most recently the Columbian in Southwest Washington. Uh, and for the last six months or so, I've been <clears throat> freelancing uh, majority of the time for Getty Images, uh, but I've also done work for the Associated Press and Reuters uh, covering the protests in downtown Portland. Um, as Leticia said, we're well over 150 days, uh, no sign of stopping. Uh, and I think one of the biggest challenges there is just talking about, you know, which protests are BLM protests, which protests are a separate type of thing and how do you accurately and fairly, you know, have that conversation while still covering the nightly protests. Yeah, absolutely. And we don't want to miss Kelsey's introduction either. So Kelsey, if you would tell us a little bit about where you live and work down in California. Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for having me. I'm so excited to be here this afternoon. My name is Kelsey. I graduated in December 2017 uh, from WSU Pullman with my degree in journalism and media production. Um, in college, I uh, freelanced for um, a couple of papers and organizations um, and had the amazing opportunity to uh, work as a journalist through college. Um, when I graduated, I changed course a bit. Um, I moved down to Los Angeles, California, where I have lived for almost three years now. Um, and uh, pretty much as soon as I moved down there, I started volunteering at a uh, rape crisis and domestic violence agency. Um, and I loved it. It was difficult and challenging, obviously, um, but I found it really fulfilling and it used the same uh, skill sets, at least in my mind, uh, that I had honed. Um, through college studying journalism. Um, so I've worked in social services ever since. I currently work uh, as a housing navigator at Neighborhood Legal Services of LA County. Um, and my uh, clients are all folks who are uh, facing eviction. So I work with them um, and provide crisis intervention, emotional support, uh, housing support, um, and connection to community resources to make sure that they don't become unhoused as a result of, uh, of their eviction. Um, and eventually I hope to pursue my master's in public policy so that I can take all my personal experiences and everything I'm learning uh, working in social services to a more macro scale. That is fantastic. Thank you all so much for your introductions. And what I found to be just completely fascinating when I was preparing for the panel and talking with all of you was the kind of experiences and like kind of personal journeys that you all have gone through this year and earlier as well. But obviously 2020 has been a year of many um, un unexpected uncertain things and a time of change for everybody. So I'm wondering if each of you can share with the audience some of the things that you have experienced. So thinking about what it's been like in your neighborhoods and the areas where you work. And you can start us off by telling us what happened and then we'll get into more of the how that experience has been and kind of dealing with the emotions of it. Um, some, of, some of which you've talked with me about over email and our audience would love to hear about. So how about um, just keep the spotlight on Kelsey if that's okay. And then you can express to the audience some of what you expressed to me in our emails. 
Absolutely, I'd love to share. Um, so outside of uh, my paid work, my nine to five, um, I've also been organizing with a group uh, called White People for Black Lives, which is LA's chapter of a national organization called um, Showing Up for Racial Justice. Um, and the organization's primary goal is to mobilize white folks for racial justice, because at the end of the day, white supremacy is a system that we uphold as white people. And therefore it is our job to be an active participant in finding the uh, solution and ultimately ending uh, white supremacy. Um, so I have been uh, involved with that group since I moved to LA, mostly uh, beginning with working on um, some campaign stuff locally um, at the county level. And uh, one of the, the things that gave me hope over this summer um, and this past year, obviously, with everything that has happened, um, was that we uh, had meetings. We've always had webinars. And um, one of our big tenets is that we encourage white folks to have hard conversations with one another about race, with your family members, with your friends, with your social circle. Um, and our webinars and book clubs and events like that used to have, you know, 20 or 30, maybe 50 people on a good day. Um, but since the uprising started, um, we've been seeing hundreds of people from all over the country and even people in different countries who are investing in the work um, and are really trying to actively learn and unlearn the ways in which um, we as white people are perpetuating racism, um, whether we are necessarily recognizing it or not. Um, and getting to be a part of that work has been amazing because I think one of the things, at least for me personally, that I always feel um, is that I'm not doing enough, that I could never possibly be doing enough, no matter how much I am doing. Um, and so seeing so many people so energized um, and actually going out and taking to the streets or donating money or having hard conversations, whatever each individual person's capacity is, seeing people really tap into that in a genuine way on such massive scales has definitely um, given me a lot of, uh, of hope in these times. Um, especially because uh, we are in a global pandemic, it's an election year. Um, and then obviously we have all these things that have been broiling for a long time that have come to the surface this year, um, particularly pertaining to racism in America and how that really is the, the bedrock of our country. Um, and so now this you know, national conversation uh, that is being had. Um, I think it's really important to carry that momentum forward in any way that we can. Um, and my my organizing work has, outside of my nine to five work, um, has very much been a, a home for channeling that energy, not only for myself, but also helping others to uh, channel that energy as well. That's fantastic. And I think that was a pretty common thread with the communication I've had from all of the panelists is that you may have a, a nine to five job and a lot of the jobs that you do are not nine to five jobs to begin with, but that when you do this kind of work, it becomes all encompassing and it becomes something that you're really living in in the moment. Nathan, can I pop things over to you and have you talk about some of your experiences taking photographs in Portland throughout the summer? Sure, yeah. Uh, so the protests in Portland started day after George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis. And they really have not stopped. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, ebbs and flows as far as crowd size, as far as what action the protesters are taking. But uh, protests have been pretty consistent since then. Um, I've been out covering the protests since the first night. Um, I have not been out every night, uh, but I've been out probably 70% of the nights. Um, what that means is that uh, I've been a firsthand witness to a lot of um, police brutality against protesters in an American city. Um, and I've also been a firsthand witness to how these protests have 
at least in Portland, um, grown and adapted and changed as national media interests came in, as the president started commenting on them. Um, and as there was division within the protest groups here in Portland itself. Um, so, you know, one of the things that uh, I always try to talk to people about when we're seeing these protests is that, you know, uh, the protests are not, not a homogenous thing. It's, it's a lot of different groups, a lot of different activist groups that have existed in Portland for years. Um, they have competing messages and agendas, um, but they often come together to uh, try to affect social change because they know that they're stronger as a collective unit. Um, what that means, though, is that it can be very hard to report on the protests in Portland um, clearly and succinctly because there's so much nuance any given night that you're out there with protesters. If you have a group of 300, 400 protesters, you've got four or five different activist organizations that have come together to bring those people out um, and who are kind of marshalling forces that night. And so uh, oftentimes you'll have four reporters going to a protest and they'll all come out with four different stories about what happened because there's many different groups and depending on who you are as a journalist and who you are as a photographer, you have access to some groups and you don't have access to others. So, um, it can, be, it can be a difficult task, um, especially when you have national media outlets that will, and I say that working for a national media outlet, that will parachute in for a weekend without a great understanding of what's happening, photograph, you know, protesters throwing stuff at a cop, cops responding, and then they want to sum up the story with, well, we were here for this weekend, and, and this is the, the end-all, be-all of what was happening, and this has been... CNN or MSNBC, and we'll see you guys in Portland in two months next time we think it's interesting. So, you know, while that's happening, and this, at the same time, we've got local reporters who, you know, are with these groups almost every single night, um, are in really long conversations with, with the protesters about, you know, the ethics of reporting on them and what things we do and what things we don't do. Um, and so that has been, um, it's been really rewarding. It's also been really, very challenging, um, you know, one of the things that as a journalist, you have to have to tell these stories is, is access. You can't report on these stories from a block away. You kind of have to be in the crowd and, and, and with the, the people who are getting beaten by cops and sometimes with the cops when they're having things thrown at them. And so, you know, one of the biggest challenges has been how do we continue to report on the story, um, which in Portland anyways, oftentimes involves crowds of people doing very illegal things. Um, how do we report on that and keep the balance of reporting on it ethically and keeping your access to the groups um, while not, mm, uh, uh, you know, censoring what's actually happening? And then while that's also happening, it's important to point out that, you know, the as I said earlier, sometimes the groups that go out and they tear down a statue or they break into a police uh, station you know, they oftentimes get grouped in with folks that are marching peacefully on the other side of town. And so it's been a challenge, I think, for journalists locally, myself included, to draw that distinction between what really is a BLM movement, what is um, a, a different kind of thing where they have the same social justice goals, but they're going about it through different ways. And all the while, quite, quite frankly, reporting on it as a white guy who, you know, honestly have a, has a certain amount of privilege and is trying to learn a lot about these groups I'm reporting on while I'm doing it. So there's a lot of different challenges going on. It's very, uh, it's very rewarding work. It's very challenging work. Um, and I'm not sure if we're going to see an end to protest in Portland anytime soon. It's very difficult to even try to imagine the complexity of what's going on over there without actually being there. So it's it's really insightful to hear your take on everything and your positioning in that. Leticia, I wonder if we could have you speak about your experience also being in Portland and reporting from a slightly different perspective and then how you've um, you know, kind of walked some of those same ethical lines that Nathan was talking about. Yeah, so unlike Nathan, I kind of stopped going to the protests, so I don't cover them anymore. But um, actually, my very first week at the job, I, um, I one of my assignments was to go out and cover a protest, and that was my first one. And 
it was interesting to be there because I was hearing all these people speak and hearing all these chants and it was like really emotional and I didn't know it was going to hit me that hard to hear people like out here protesting for something that's very personal to me and um on top of that I was also in contact with my editor like and he was just like you know helping me guiding me through that process that night and um so while I'm gathering my emotions I'm working on reporting um and getting the entire picture um so I once I stopped going to the protests I kind of focused on something uh, a little bit differently um from the comfort of my own home um because I just I don't know I felt like um I just didn't feel like I felt like I could do a lot more from home you know because there were so many reporters out there um but also I feel like being a journalist of color I'm feeling because uh, I feel like I'm filling a gap that's really needed in Portland by writing from my lens um as a black person so um and a really in a really white city which is Portland um and so what I kind of do in my reporting is um, try to, I, since my beat is covering those marginalized communities, I try to just include those voices in my articles. Um, and how I, how I felt emotionally after, um, after leaving the protest and just kind of reporting from home, it's been, some, it's been um, emotionally tolling, but really rewarding. And I'm really grateful to be in this position in this moment. It feels, it, it feels amazing to be able to do that, but it, it is a lot. I've spoken with, um, my articles have made me speak with a lot of sexual assault survivors, um, victims of police brutality, as well as um, I've been doing the series called Black and White in Oregon. And it's kind of, I, I know I'm analyzing data each week um, based on what it's like to be a black person versus a white person in Oregon or Portland or this county. And, um, it's kind of like these things that everybody knows in the back of their mind is true, but when you look at the data, it becomes really real and you can really see the deep inequities that are facing this, um, this state. Uh, for example, uh, a, an average black family in Portland can't afford to live in a single neighborhood in Portland while um, a white, uh, the average income of a white family, they can afford to live in every single neighborhood in, this, <laughs> in, in Portland. Um, so they, if that's just one example of the many different ways that um, uh, black and white people have different experiences in the state. Um, and so when you kind of find this one inequity, it leads you to another and another and another and another. And then you realize like, oh, they're really, <laughs> it's just, it's become really real to me. Um, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for sharing that. And mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think you just spoke to and you had shared with me in, in an email as well is just the, you keep digging away at these layers of complexity, right? And realizing that when we're looking at something like privilege, it exists on a continuum and there's many different levels of, you know, of privilege ranging from the most to the very least. And it um, is something that we're all continuing to learn and learning to, to navigate. I wonder if we can shoot things over to Catherine and come back to the topic of objectivity and reporting, because I know one of the things you had expressed to me was trying to remain ob objective in your reporting through the use of data and really taking data and looking at how to present the facts in a way that is objective and gets the message across, you know, but walks that line with, um, you know, maybe your personal opinions of what's going on. Yeah, I think that's one of the hardest things about reporting on these things is a journalist can't say specifically that they endorse a certain civil rights movement, especially in Spokane, because we do have so many conservative families and being right on the border of Idaho, we also do have to take into consideration our viewers in, in Idaho as well. But that's also made the protests very interesting, just because we do have to deal with the Proud Boys and the militias that do come over uh, quite frequently. And the first time we had a protest was six days after George Floyd was killed. That was on May 31st. And that was my first weekend I was producing the five and 6 p.m. newscast. So on top of the stress of being first time five, six producer, I'm also dealing with this protest coverage. And I had two reporters there and they were there the entire day. And the main group that does activism in Spokane was the one that held this, this protest. And they are very good at being like, these are what we're demanding. These are why we're here, which makes 
my job so much more easier because I can say, here's this piece of paper, a list that they handed our reporter being like, this is exactly why we're here. And this is what we want from the city of Spokane. Uh, there's thousands of people that showed up to that protest. Uh, they eventually went from Riverfront Park and they marched around downtown Spokane until they got to the courthouse. And at the courthouse is when it started to get a little bit more heated. Uh, they just, between the officers and between people chanting and like getting very much up in their face. Uh, and then it eventually ended by six. So nothing violent had happened during my shows. I had two reporters there and they're both just doing live hits and just being like, this is what's happening. This is what we're seeing. This is what people are telling us. And we had a couple people from both sides of an issue. Some of them were people who supported BLM. Some people that were there for counter protests being like all lives matter. And we making sure that if we're gonna play a sound bite from someone, we make sure we get a sound bite from both sides to show both sides of what's actually going on. So after that is when the protest uh, decided, ended people started leaving. And then that's when things started picking up and people went to downtown towards the Riverfront Square Mall. And as soon as my news coverage ended, I asked my news director if I can go out and with my camera and photograph what was going on. And that's, once I got downtown is when they broke into the first store. And after that happened is when police really stepped in and was like, everyone needs to leave. So they were clearing streets and I was with one of my reporters and my photographers. And as soon as I got down there, my photographer had his giant camera on his shoulder and every, he sees everyone scattered through his lens. And he looks down through his lens in his camera and you see, see the tear gas grenade and it just goes right up, right in his face. And he falls backwards with the camera. So we have to like drag him back. We really forced him to come back to the station because he's like, no, no, I'm going to stay. And I was like, no, you're, you need to go back. So after that is when we eventually walked around to Riverfront Park, and that's where we heard that police were firing tear gas and rubber bullets at uh, agitators is what we were calling them, because it's very hard towing the line of what do you call these people who are causing violence, because you don't want to say it's the protesters, but, you know, are you going to call it a riot if the city doesn't call it a riot? So it's very interesting trying to figure out what that language is that you should be using. Um, and in my experience, because seeing nationwide, I feel like some of the police, there are some journalists being like, you know, police are being not great to us and they aren't being good towards us as journalists and getting arrested and things like that. But from my experience, at least here in Spokane, uh, the police saw us wearing our, we were very bright blue jackets as the station, the Heather station name on it. And they saw us and they'd wave us back before they fire again. So, you know, that made us feel a bit more comfortable uh, if we did, something did happen, it was definitely an accidental friendly fire from them towards us at least. But, um, and yeah, it was just, it was a lot. It was kind of, yeah. I honestly couldn't imagine being in Portland, like uh, in a, as a journalist having to deal with 150 straight nights of the protest because that was the main one we had to deal with. And then after that came the smaller, the smaller protests that continued to follow and then days after that we started digging more into data and trying to figure out what is Spokane's actual data on top of this BLM protest that's going on and a month after that night happened we got new data from the Spokane police that black residents from Spokane County are five times more likely to get arrested so trying to use things like that to be like this is why people are out protesting Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you said about choosing your words carefully is so important. And that's something that I always come back to when I'm thinking about and teaching communication and trying to think about like the specific words that we use for situations really do make a difference in how that message is received by, you know, various audiences. And I wonder if I can uh, pop things back to Nathan for just a couple of minutes, because Nathan, you had a, a pretty scary situation that you dealt with while out taking photos too with a hostile, a hostile group that you came across. Yeah. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, well, I've had a lot of really scary incidents, uh, <laughs> but I think I know the one you're talking about. So I think mm. I'll dive into that. Uh, you're talking about wildfires, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah so this got uh, more publicity than I think I <clears throat> probably wanted it to. But we, uh, you know, about a hundred and 
20 days into the protest, we had really massive wildfires that uh, was somewhat threatening uh, Portland suburbs. Uh, they grew almost 900,000 acres in a 24 hour period, uh, um, really put a lot of concern into people out here. And so kind of overnight, a lot of the news coverage shifted from uh, covering protests in downtown Portland to going out into some of those, um, the cities that border the, the downtown area and, and covering the evacuation efforts, um, covering some of the fire damage. Um, and even the protesters, for what it's worth, a lot of them stopped protesting uh, and some of the mutual aid groups that come out with the medics and, and some of the, the food organizations, they started going out into these communities as well. And so there was kind of this, this overlap. Uh, to be clear, they were going out to, to help residents. Um, so the first day that I was out covering, I was in Estacado, which is about 30 minutes uh, east of Portland. Uh, and I was driving around in a level three evacuation zone, um, just looking for evacuations, looking for fire damage, looking for the fire line. And I had pulled off to the side of the road to, um, to take a photo that I, I kind of saw in retrospect, it wasn't even a good photo, but I pulled over to take it and um, a blue pickup truck came up on me and, and they basically, this guy in this truck basically accused me of being a Antifa looter uh, and was very upset that I was there. And I tried to, you know, calmly explain like, here's my press credentials, here's who I am, here's who I'm working for. Um, he was not, uh, not, he was not convinced. He continued to believe that I was a looter. And, you know, one of the things that you have taught when you cover really hostile environments is that uh, de-escalation is always the key. Oftentimes you're not going to win a logical argument about this is who I am and I have a right to be here. It's just best to, to step away and back out. So I told him not a problem. I'm happy to leave. I don't want to be anyone's issue. So I got in my car and I started driving away and he followed me for about a mile, uh, maybe a little bit longer. And I got another truck came up in front of me, blocked the road and a gentleman got out with a rifle uh, and pointed it at me. And we had a tense conversation for a couple minutes. Uh, Again, accusing me of being a looter, accusing me of uh, being somebody that I'm not. Um, so we, I was able to kind of calm them down a little bit and, and talk them out of that. Uh, and it ended with a nice, uh, a nice promise that if I ever came back to Estacada, I would be shot and killed, which is a problem because I'm in Estacada a lot. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think it's a good example of some of the, the tense situations that evolve right now around Portland. Um, I, I had told, I had told uh, uh, Aaron, or I'm sorry, uh, I don't remember who earlier, that um, a lot of times when you cover these fires out there, communities are usually really excited that you're there. Uh, they're usually feeling like they're going through this traumatic moment that they want the world to see. Oftentimes the towns are decimated, you know, people have lost lives and they're, they're they're generally happy that somebody is there paying attention to what's going on. But this year during fire season, it's been a very different, very different uh, experience and vibe. Um, you know, people are just as likely as to offer you a cup of coffee and lunch as they are to point a gun at you. So um, it was very common driving around all of Oregon. I covered fires from the very Northern border to the very Southern border in Oregon. Uh, you see these signs everywhere that says looters will be shot um you know we won't ask questions we'll just shoot things like that and so it, it heightens your security thinking a little bit um uh, but coming out of the protests it honestly was uh pretty much the same the same operating thinking as as usual so mm -hmm. yeah absolutely i mean it's just it's it's mind-boggling to me to hear these stories and you know just to consider the level of potential harm that you all are putting yourselves in by being out there and reporting on uh, these events and for a continued you know, period of time too. It's not like going out once, which would be scary enough, but having multiple incidences over a series of time, you know, puts a lot of, of ongoing stress and you know, po post-traumatic kind of stress on uh, people like you. And I you know Nathan and, and Catherine had both expressed some of that to me, just, you know, things like hearing a car backfiring and hitting the ground as fast as you possibly could, thinking that it was, you know, was gunfire or an explosion. 
So I would like to turn things back to Nishika. We haven't heard from you for a little while. And obviously uh, your position is more of a, a, a public information officer. You work in crisis communication. So your interaction through your work and with the public is a bit different from those of our journalists, which is, is great. So we wanna get some of the strategic communication perspective as well. So if you could talk a little bit about some of what you've seen and experienced in your communities and the community that you work in and your neighborhoods and then how you've been working to advance equity a little bit more in more detail. Yeah, so uh, in my community, I would say that, uh, well, first I, I will preface by saying I grew up in complete poverty. And so I recently became a homeowner and I am kind of in this like middle class neighborhood now. Um, which is great. I have, you know, I have a teenage son. I live with my husband, dog and a cat. And um, I think that there was a sense, especially because this is a pre predominantly white area, almost every area in Snohomish County is a predominantly white area. Um, just, is it safe? Is it safe for my son to go running? Is it, is it safe because we are new? Do people recognize us? Do they feel like we belong here? Do we feel like we belong here? Uh, that kind of a thing. And then um, when some of the protests started uh, happening in downtown Seattle and Portland, things like that, we started to see um, flags and signs go up in our neighborhood that, um, I mean, most of them were BLM signs and they were, uh, or flags. Uh, and that, I have to say that felt really good. It felt like um, maybe I don't have to be as scared as I was, you know, coming to this new neighborhood. And so that was kind of like my personal feeling about my neighborhood. And then, you know, just uh, further downtown in my own city, uh, different protests and things like that have popped up here and there. They've been mostly peaceful and some small, some bigger. And most of them have been led by uh, youth, I, I'm finding. A lot of uh, student led and I would say like high school youth. Uh, through the uh, Black Student Unions and things like that coming together in Everett School or Everett Public Schools and then uh, working with uh, different officials to kind of make that happen. And so it's been really impressive and uh, inspiring. If anything, it's made me bolder and uh, several of those students have reached out to me and asked for assistance, you know, when they're meeting with uh, school officials and things like that. And uh, as far as my, my work, I would say that uh, in hearing the journalists uh, on the panel talk about their experiences, it's, it's kind of the flip side. Uh, we're thinking about how can we maintain safe service while protests are going on. And so there's a lot of strategic planning that goes into that as well as communicating with our writers and um, you know, even people who aren't our writers uh, because you know, there's a benefit to people who still actually um, drive into work you know, to have people on our buses because that means less traffic for them, right? So it's kind of like everybody wants to know, are, are you gonna be able to get folks in and out of Seattle if there's a protest? So a lot of communication around that. And that is, uh, for somebody who, who wasn't in transportation, that takes a lot of coordination with uh, many subject matter experts and some of them outside of my agency, like law enforcement and um, you know the, the health district and things like that. Just all different kinds of uh, different groups kind of come together to work on these. Yeah, absolutely. Just coordinating that communication and then, and as, as you know, as a crisis communicator during times of uncertainty, people's need for information goes up and then you're trying to deal with various stakeholder groups and meet the needs of a variety of audience members. So I imagine that's been a lot to try to balance as you know, you've been working through this, this process. For so, sure. Yeah, I wonder if we could turn things back to Kelsey for a few minutes and um, Kelsey, maybe just talk a little bit more about, cause you had kind of an interesting trajectory of actually studying uh, journalism and media production and then going into social work, right? And all of that kind of focuses on your role as a communicator, just a communicator from a variety of different perspectives. So how do you see your role as a, a communicator and working within the communities that you're in to, 
you know, do everything that you can to advance equity and try to um, find housing and so forth for your, your members. Absolutely. Thanks, Erin. Um, I think it's twofold um, because the, the communication between um, myself and my clients is obviously incredibly important. That's where I build the trust, um, which is sometimes um, difficult, understandably so, because a lot of folks um, who have had to uh, seek out benefits, whether it's from nonprofits or from the government, um, get kicked around a lot, especially in a county as large as LA. Um, caseworkers for all sorts of social service programs are notoriously overworked. Burnout is really high. Um, so taking the time uh, and just investing in that that one on one relationship so that that trust is built is ultimately hinges on communication and is incredibly important to doing anything else uh, further with the client or offering any other services or support. Um, and then once that component is uh, established and cemented. Um, then it's much easier. My clients know that they can call me um, whenever they need anything and that I will do my very best to um, assist them. And that looks so different on a day-to-day -day basis. Some days it's me um, calling the uh, DCFS social workers, the Department of Children and Family Services social workers to um, try to explain the client situation um, and that they really aren't um, it's not their fault that they are unhoused and therefore the DCFS should not be faulting the parents and trying to take away their kids because of their housing instability situation. Um, and it also allows me to really help the client get out whatever the real root is, whether that's, you know, that they um, have a disability that they haven't been able to get uh, monthly payments from because they haven't been able to access a lawyer to file an appeal, um, whether it's that they are sh really struggling with mental health and have fallen through uh, the cracks and aren't able to uh, get stable support and therefore aren't able to think about or even worry about um, bills and budgets and all those things that um, that you need to live in this society. Um, so it's also about meeting people where they are at, um, which also involves communication. Um, and I think one of the big things that I learned working as a journalist was how to listen, like really listen to people. Um, and obviously we can never understand other people's perspectives and experiences, um, but listening, really listening and reflecting on that um, absolutely is important to establishing connection and some sort of an understanding, even though obviously it cannot be as deep as actually living in that person's body and experiencing life as they do. Um, so that's a very important uh, aspect to the work as well that I found um, clear mm -hmm. connections to uh, the work that I did in journalism. And then uh, there's also the second factor of that, which is the more uh, external communication. Um, so in order to get the funding to provide services, um, we have to fulfill our grant requirements. So there's an aspect of communication there in um, asking clients. Uh, a lot of times once folks have finished the program, uh, we found new housing for them together. Um, and they want to transition out of services. Um, one of the big questions that I get asked is, well, now that this is the end, like, what can I do? How can I uh, say thank you? And I, I always tell folks, one of the best things you can do is share your story, because I think it's a myth that there are people that are voiceless. Everyone has a voice. It's just a matter of who are we listening to? Who is society prioritizing? What are the dominant narratives at play? And when everyone actually gets a chance and a platform to use their voice, then that's where we really start learning and digging in. 
Um, and I had one client, we were having a conversation about this. And she was like, when I was going through the eviction process, I had no idea how it worked. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go. No one talks about this. Um, and that's such a real thing, especially with anything that is stigmatized, which one of the biggest things that is stigmatized in our society is poverty, is being low income. Um, and uh, that is a real barrier to feeling like you can openly uh, discuss these things. Um, and obviously every issue is a racial justice issue, including um, poverty, including housing justice. Um, so there's also the, the external component of um, encouraging folks to talk and share their stories, to join their local tenants union um, so that they feel like they, they have support from other folks who are going through uh, similar issues because there's so much power in uh, that solidarity and in um, expressing yourself and your experiences and having people really hear and really listen uh, to that. That was an amazing segue to really getting to the heart of the panel, which is this idea of power of voice. And I was very curious to hear from each of our panelists a little bit about what that means to you. And depending on your perspective and your own position and your own work you know, that you're doing, and Kelsey spoke to that uh, really well. Could we turn it over to Leticia and have you touch base on that too? Because I think some of uh, what Kelsey had to say might be somewhat similar in terms of the work you're doing with the black and white in Portland and um, just connecting with people in your community and working to amplify the voices that aren't typically heard. Yeah, so when I was thinking about um, what power of voice meant, uh, the one thing that really stood out to me was just equity. Um, because when everybody's voices are heard at the table and when they're all amplified equally, um, their unique issues and challenges that they're facing could be addressed. Um, but if they're not known or if they're not, um, or if they're pushed to the side, um, then it's a lot easier to be like, oh, they're not realize what problems they have. Because from what I've learned um, is that from just analyzing data about um, racial demographics is that each like demographic is experiencing things completely differently. You can't like, group anything. You can't talk about anything, whether it's housing, income, poverty levels, school grades. Um, you can't talk about any of those things as a whole without um, looking about looking at how it's impacting each and every demographic. Because you could say that, oh, scores are going up, but it might just be averaging out that way. Um, and this one group might still be really struggling. So it's important to really put an emphasis on that. Um, and then kind of what I do in my just daily reporting is looking to uh, focus on, like even if it's just a simple topic of an article that I'm writing, um, if there's two equally qualified people to be speaking on the subject, um, but one of them is a person of color, I will, I'm inclined to choose that person of color to speak on it because they're gonna, I know that they're gonna speak from their own experiences that aren't often heard, um, that, are, uh, that need to be heard, um, especially in Portland. So um, that's just kind of what I, and also because that's, that's what my beat is focused on too, so yeah. Absolutely. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, you did. That was very, very well stated. Uh, Nashika, let's pop things back to you in terms of what you think of as, like, what's the, the heart of the meaning of power of voice for you? Yeah, I think uh, uh, my why, as far mm -hmm. as my why I continue to um, to work towards advancing racial equity. And so that is kind of what I always uh, come back to. And my why, if I can read it to you, is um, that I believe that everyone deserves equal access to public services and equitable supports to become their best selves. And it's my responsibility to make my voice heard and take action when I see that racial equity can move forward. Uh, I will know that I'm leaving my why as a transformational leader for racial equity when I no longer sacrifice candor for comfort. And I think that's really been key to me in this year is 
uh, understanding why uh, at times I've made a choice to kind of um, be quiet or to uh, play it small and now kind of stepping into that power and really speaking to uh, situations where I know that we can do better, whether that's uh, professionally or personally or out in the community. So if there's a listening session with, um, uh, you know, somebody had a question in the chat, but um, if there's a listening session with law enforcement or um, student resource officers, which are law enforcement in public schools, then I'm jumping on there and I'm having, um, I'm, I'm asking those tough questions. I'm being a part of the conversation instead of kind of just, um, you know, having, having conversations, uh, you know, at home about it. I'm actually trying to get people to think about it. And then taking that into the workplace, if I see something that is kind of okay corporate, but I know that, that we should be doing better, then I'm, I'm saying that I'm, I'm doing whatever it takes to kind of move that forward, even if it makes me feel uncomfortable at times, so. I think that was extremely well said, and I can relate to that as well, that uh, notion of choosing not to stay comfortable, but to go, go with candor and have those hard conversations. If we could turn things back over to Nathan, and I wonder if we could kind of circle back because I think this falls right in with um, what you said earlier about trying to navigate your position as a white male out you know, reporting on these kinds of issues and how you've kind of personally worked your way or are working your way through that and just some of the challenges that come along with that and how you can um, perhaps use your privilege as a way to promote equity and speak and give voice to those who need to be heard. Sure. Um, I think at the outset of this answer, I think it's important to remember that there is, I think, a misunderstanding of what objectivity is in journalism nowadays. Um, objectivity is not necessarily showing two sides for the sake of showing two sides. It's being accurate and truthful on the stories that deserve it and not necessarily giving a platform to say white supremacists in an equal amount of time as you can platform to say BLM protesters. So when I go into a story, <clears throat> I'm always trying to think about, you know, what, what voice needs to be amplified here? Uh, what voice maybe needs to be mentioned, uh, but not necessarily put at the forefront of this conversation. And I'm always hyper aware, especially going into something like the BLM protests that, as has been pointed out, you know, I'm a white male who's, uh, somewhat deep in the journalism industry. And so what I try to do is I try to make myself a conduit for the voices that I think really deserve to be heard. That's not to say that I am the arbiter of what voices should be heard and what shouldn't be heard. I'm just using my best, my best judgment when I'm out there. Um, and, you know, I happen to be in a scenario where I've been trained how to go into a situation like a protest, figure out who's there, what's going on, what people's agendas are, and then basically, for lack of a better word, sell that to a national editor somewhere. Hey, here's why this is interesting to you. And so me personally, what I spend a lot of my time doing right now uh, is I'd say probably 80% of my work is just talking to community activists, talking to organizers, talking to protesters, uh, talking to, unfortunately, sometimes white supremacists and, and far right organizers. And then finding a way to keep national editors interested in the story in Portland. And that sounds a little um, crass and transactional, but for our, from where I'm coming up from, this is an incredibly important story. And uh, unless you have somebody who's actively out there finding new ways to keep national editors interested, the, the national narrative is gonna move on really quickly. And the protesters that are not gonna go home if the national narrative moves on, um, they're going to lose a lot of the protection that they get from having large national news outlets out there. So uh, that's kind of how I try to approach it. Um, you know, simultaneously, uh, I do a lot of listening while I'm out there. Um, I have personally, and I'm not going to go into what they are, but I have personally changed a lot of my held beliefs uh, while covering the protests. I, I try not to talk about my beliefs publicly or my political affiliations publicly, but I will say that I went into uh, 
covering the protest with one expectation of what I feel and what I see. And um, I have a completely different expectation uh, now. And so I think as a journalist, any journalist, uh, you know, you've always got to be keeping your ears open, your eyes open and, and never thinking that you know what's happening. I mean, I think you can have an expectation of what you're going to see, but understanding that you're making a lot of assumptions and that, you know, those assumptions are based off of your personal history, oftentimes your race, how the world treats you because of your race, um, and being willing to see and understand new um, new ways that other people have been treated and experienced life. So that's kind of a convoluted answer to your question, but I think the the short version is just, you know, going out there and making sure that you're not going out as a photographer, like, man, I want to see you know, some protesters get beaten up because I want to win an award. Like, that's not what it's about. It's about going out and making sure that as a journalist with a platform, you're trying to elevate the voices that need to be elevated. And while you may need to get a quote from somebody on the far right or a white supremacist, you're not necessarily putting them on the same platform because they're not, they're not the same thing. Um, so that's my answer. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. I think that's really helpful. So let's just turn things back over to Catherine for a moment. If you want to speak to what you think of as power of voice, what that means to you. And then we have quite a few questions coming in on the chat. So then we'll get to hear uh, what our panelists have to say for our audience questions. Catherine? Yeah, I'd definitely echo what Nathan said, because compared to what I see come down from national outlets versus what I've actually experienced can be a little different sometimes and putting yourself directly in where these news events happen kind of gives you a much different perspective. Uh, growing up and before I was a journalist, I knew there was uh, inequities and that people weren't treated equally and being put into the direct line of having to report on that really kind of changes your personal opinion. Uh, of having to look at the data and compare what's actually going on and hear what people who have actually experienced that kind of uh, inequity say about how it makes them feel. Um, and one of the other things that was mentioned was the, the police departments talking about you know, communicating with the media. KHQ, we had a, a two hour town hall session where we had the mayor of Spokane, we had the sheriff's office, we had the police department, and we had the president of the NAACP, we had members of communities all across Spokane come together for two hours and talk about why they feel that way and why they do what they do. And it was a really great conversation between all those different types of people who have very different experiences. But after that, it was very much like, I personally didn't see a lot of movement forward with the people who were at that town hall discussion. Uh, the best thing that we've seen in Spokane since the protests have happened is the NAACP and the sheriff's office are now working together as a coalition to try to combat issues of police brutality and the rate of arrests of uh, a white person versus someone of, of color. So we'll turn things over to some audience questions now. And um, Corey's been helping me monitor the chat. So I'm gonna take these not necessarily in the order that they came in, but a couple of the questions are similar to each other. So I'll pose these and then uh, whichever of our panelists, some of them are, are general to the whole panel. So if you have an immediate answer, go ahead and uh, raise your hand, start speaking and Connelly can put the spotlight on you. A couple of the questions that came through um, are with regard to how do you start conversations with people who don't recognize their own privilege? Uh, one of our attendees stated her question is, how do you bring this subject up to those who have never been marginalized and may not believe that this is a serious matter or that it is happening? So let's start with that. And then there's a couple of uh, layers there and some, some similar questions from other audience members. Does anyone want to tackle that one to start us off? Go ahead, Nashika. So I, I deal with this uh, a lot in um, public transportation. Uh, many of the folks who are um, leading these efforts are um, not people of color or people who have not been marginalized. Um, and I think that it's important to bring it back to at least you know where I work, customers and the customer experience. So, that's been, sorry, that's been really important uh, to 
to bring it back to the customers and their experiences. And if I feel that they um, are not grasping that from the customer standpoint, then often I will allow myself to be a bit vulnerable and talk about my own experiences since I can access them and, and talk about what it's like to um, live in poverty or uh, you know, uh, be what is known as uh, transit dependent because there's this intersection um, as, as someone on the panel uh, mentioned before between many of uh, uh, the public services and things like that and equity and equality, which are not the same. And so mm -hmm. it's really important to recognize that they're different and that there is often because of systemic racism, a connection between all of these public services. And so sometimes it's just kind of a, a teaching moment and sometimes it's in a moment where I can be a bit vulnerable and access that information. That's great. Does anybody else on the panel have additional comments related to anything that Shika had to say or want to elaborate on that? Sure, absolutely. I'd, I'd like to speak on it. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that personally um, I have uh, been working on over the years. Um, I have some, I grew up in a very small, small town, Monroe, Washington. Um, very, very white, if not exclusively white, um, and uh, have family that live in that same general area um, who I've had conversations with very similar to, to what the person had written in the chat of um, folks who just don't understand. Um, and there's also that uh, barricade that you have to get through first of defensiveness of this idea of, well, no, like I have experienced struggle as well as often something that comes up. Folks will bring up, well, oh, I, you know, have struggled with my mental health and um, I have experienced um, like negative effects or discrimination from that. Or folks will say, well, um, you know, I am a single parent. Uh, I, uh, I'm low income. I, I have not had money consistently to meet my basic needs. Um, and, you know, on and on and on, there's many more examples, but uh, the importance of really digging in and coming at least first to an understanding of, can we agree that people have different experiences, that your experience is not going to be the same as someone else's. And if we can get to that point and we can understand, okay, not all of our experiences are different, then we can bring in the broader perspective and facts of, okay, yes, our experiences are not all different. So how are those experiences stratified in our society? It's based on race, it's based on gender, it's based on class and all these other things. But I think you uh, mentioned this earlier, Erin, privilege is a spectrum and not everyone is oppressed as much as anyone else and privilege does have layers. Uh, but it's just about, in my experience, slowly peeling back the layers with people. And again, I really think that this is white people's job to be going out and having these conversations in person or over the phone when possible, not on Facebook, bit by bit, just chipping away at deepening folks understanding um, until they, you know, hopefully eventually um, start to go out and, and do a little bit of their own learning um, or go into spaces where they may be very uncomfortable, which is necessary for the unlearning process. Um, but they're going to be hearing things and listening to things that will um, help them shape uh, their understanding further. Um, and I think those conversations are so important because there's no way to get to a society that is equal, I think, if we, especially the folks who are the most privileged, white people, sh just shut down and say, well, I'm not going to talk to my racist relatives because it's stressful and hard. That's what I see as our job and what we really need to do, invest in that time, invest in that energy um, and just keep chipping away. It's gonna be frustrating 
um, you're going to hit dead end. But uh, I think it is really, really important to continue uh, trying as best you can and leveraging whatever the relationship that you have with this person. If this person is your family member or your friend, um, using that connection that you have with them and understanding what makes them tick. Are they a person that's very empathetic? Then, then you know, you can use that um, or whatever the, the, the case may be. Um, but absolutely keep having those hard conversations is what I would say to sum it up. Thank you. That was extremely well articulated. Catherine, I saw you unmuted. Do you want to speak? Yeah. So when I'm working on the assignment desk, part of my job is to manage the KHQ Facebook page. And when uh, it was the height of the protests that were happening here, uh, just the amount of phone calls and comments and Facebook messages saying like, you shouldn't be covering this, like this isn't an issue that should be covered. And there was one time I was on the phone for an hour with a gentleman who just was like, this isn't a thing, I'm totally against it. And I was on an the phone for an hour trying to give them here's all the data here's you know what the Spokane police have to say and here's what national data says and it was definitely that chipping away and I ended the phone call not being able to I feel like I wasn't able to you know, con convince them and work with him in a way to be like this is a real issue and this is you know why we're reporting on it he was very much the it's my way or the highway. And it's kind of unfortunate in situations like that when you have to deal with phone calls or read these terrible comments on Facebook posts. And since you're representing an organization, you have to be very careful about just kind of letting it go and not, not responding because it just makes people even more infuriated if people have such a straight mindset of like, this is what I believe and I'm not changing. And we work as hard as possible to, to change that and be like, this is, this is why but it's such a slow process and it's, it's very evident to see when you manage a social media account for a news organization. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad that the social, social media aspect has come up because this is one of the things I've been thinking a lot about throughout this year. And then in preparation for this panel too, is this uh, notion of sort of performative activism, right? People who hop on social media and they post a black square or, you know, they post Black Lives Matter and then consider that good enough to, you know, have participated in the movement. Um, obviously that's not good enough, right? And everybody needs, needs to be doing a lot more. And we did have several questions coming in through the, throughout the discussion on the chat about like, what can people actually do? And that was one of my questions for the panelists as well. If you could uh, share with us and maybe we'll go to Leticia. We haven't heard from you for a little while. If you have any suggestions about people listening today, they're here because they wanna to continue to learn and, and work toward equity, work toward being anti-racist and so forth. Like, what can we actually do? Like beyond social media, getting out there, having those conversations and, and other action steps that all of us could take right now today. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, so I know like at the beginning when this whole racial uprising was starting, um, people were just kind of saying, educate yourselves. Um, and I think that that's, that's really important. But what else I think, it, what other things I think that are really important to do is kind of just to listen to uh, the people in your community. Um, and then I know everybody on this panel kind of knows that already because, <laughs> but uh, just really give people the space to speak um, and the space to to share their opinions. And also, like, if there was any year to not take things personally when it comes to, to these issues, it, this is the year because, um, like, it's easy to get defensive um, about certain things. And um, even for myself, like, for anybody, everybody has space to everybody has room to grow about, cause you're not, not everybody's an expert in all these different communities. Um, so just allowing that room for growth, um, getting rid of that defensive feeling that comes up initially and um, just really having an open mind and um, listening to people and reflecting and, and really self-reflecting a lot on your words, um, the language that you use, because this hasn't come up, but like microaggressions um, mm -hmm. are really, uh, really, really harmful and they perpetuate stereotypes. And so if, whether it's your, your speaking or your reporting, um, 
just be really cautious of the language that you're using because you might think it's a minor thing, but it's actually over time, it really has a really big impact on individuals as well as um, a community as a whole. So um, I think that language piece is one of the most important things. Very good, thank you. And I think this relates somewhat to one of the questions that more recently came in on the chat was from Angelica. She says, as a woman of color who has lived her life in predominantly white spaces, I find myself caught between wanting to educate my peers who may be misinformed and wanting to prioritize myself and protecting my peace. One thing I have learned is that it shouldn't fall on BIPOC's shoulder to educate others on our experiences. How do you navigate this struggle? Yeah, I've, I've uh, also uh, thought about that a lot this year. And uh, um, what I've kind of learned is to just kind of do what you can. So don't feel obligated to say things to people or to educate them. If you don't have the mental capacity or the mental energy to do so, then, um, you know, leave the situation because your, your, your mental health is, goes before um, anything, I feel like. But if you do feel like you have like you're able to, to kind of educate a little bit. Um, I understand that that's sometimes you, you have to do that because it also comes up, comes down to like standing up for yourself. Um, and you're not just standing up for yourself when you're doing that, you're standing up for like an entire community. So um, I say do what you can, but don't beat yourself up if you can't because it is, it's, it's really hard, <laughs> so. Very good. I'd like to add to that. I just wanted to say that I think, um, you know, what Leticia said is spot on. And I think it's about choice, that it really should be your choice when you feel comfortable in, in stepping up and talking about that um, and kind of, you know, connected to that. Um, you know, uh, people have said uh, on the panel that white people should kind of step up and, and have a certain responsibility to this. And I do think that's important, but it's also important, like Leticia said, to kind of, you know, some people may want to uh, step back, not talk as much and, and listen. And I think that's super important. I've seen that play out in my own community where um, well-meaning uh, white people were coordinating events where they were trying to bring uh, communities of color and law enforcement together but they didn't actually ask the communities of color, do you want this? Do you want to be a part of this? And so, you know, yes, take responsibility, but also take that responsibility to listen. Very well said. And I think we are probably getting pretty close to the end of our time for Q&A because we are gonna have some closing remarks from Xavier Lee and Corey will introduce him in just a moment. One last question that I wanted to come to, and uh, just keep in mind too, we didn't have time to get to all of the questions in the chat, but we do are keeping a record of them and we're gonna do our best to come back and address those uh, after the fact and we can certainly stay in touch with our panelists. Wendy Rainey, who's actually one of my colleagues in the Murrow College had a really great question, which was similar to a question I had as well. She asked, how long will this moment last and what will it mean? And I think, you know, we've seen so much energy and enthusiasm this summer and somewhat tapering off a bit in the fall, but potentially with, um, you know, more, more potentially we'll pick up again after the election. I guess we'll see what happens. But how do we, as people who are interested in actively working toward an equitable society and working towards social justice, like how do we keep that momentum? How do we keep it going so that we actually work toward change and achieve change rather than just letting it fall by the wayside? Any of our panelists want to address that? And it's a big question. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll, I'll speak on that for a little bit. Um, um, how's it going to, oh yes. Yeah. So journalists uh, have a tendency to, you know, focus on the action of what's going on, you know, like the craziest thing going on. I know that's a thing in Portland for sure. Um, but I think what what's going to really get us toward active, like change toward the end of these protests or whatever is um, listening to the heart of the message of what people are, are demanding. Like 
um, listen to what, what, why, why are people out on the streets to begin with? And are we addressing those issues? Or are we just kind of focusing on, oh, this is another night, this is another night of protest, but it's like, has any action been done, uh, been made toward that, toward addressing these issues? Um, as somebody in Portland, or a couple organizations in Portland are calling for law enforcement to um, act out and speak on how they're going to protect people, um, vulnerable communities uh, around the election week and the election day, and because they haven't really done that yet. Um, so I think that that's really important. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other panelists want to follow up with that or any other comments before we turn things back over to Corey for an introduction on Xavier? Yeah, sure. I'll uh, I'll talk for a minute. Um, I think the most important thing, and I so appreciate Nishika and someone in the chat also brought it up, uh, that as white people, we do have a responsibility, but that it's also important that we are thinking and not acting on behalf of taking space from assuming we know what is best for BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, when we are out doing organizing work. Um, and it's really easy to get caught up in the excitement. Um, and I have run into uh, more than one situation um, where I have been very enthusiastic and have gone full force um, and have had peers um, come in and gently correct me. Um, and that's a part of the work. As white people, we need to be open to that. We need to understand that. We need to try our best to not put ourselves in those situations to begin with where BIPOC folks have to come in and kind of course correct us. Um, but when it does happen, we need to be open to learning and listening and taking that time. And when we do those things, I think that's how we sustain the movement is by every person just doing their part. And there is so much information out there. Um, it can be hard to know where to start, uh, but it can start in really simple and small ways such as, you know, ordering a book, ordering stamp from the beginning um, and starting there and reading that. Um, it could be attending a meeting. There's chapters that are similar to white people for black lives all over the country. Um, so it could be attending one of those meetings and kind of learning what the role of white folks is um, and putting in that work to listen and step back and reflect uh, as well. And I think uh, everyone has the ability to do something. Um, everyone has different capacities, obviously. Um, but I think with everyone doing whatever is within their capacity, we will see a sustained um, movement towards true freedom and equality. Thank you so much for that, Kelsey. I think that was a fantastic way to wrap up the Q&A session with the audience. And then we'll have the spotlight go back on Corey for a moment here so that she can introduce Xavier Lee as our uh, final speaker of the evening. And she's gonna give us some motivating closing remarks. Thank you so much, everybody, for this incredibly powerful, inspiring conversation. We need to keep this going. So I hope this stimulates conversations among ourselves, among each other, long after this panel is over. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we're going to close our program today by introducing another special guest. In addition to being a Murrow alum, Xavier Lee is a public speaker. He hosts the YouTube channel, I Am Xavier Lee. He is a father and a catalyst for positive change. And Xavier's here today to close out our program with some motivating words. So I'm turning the mic over to him now. Xavier? Thank you, Corey. Um, I don't wanna make it seem like I'm just about to give you guys like motivation. Um, personally, because I think motivation is fickle. It can, it can come and go like the wind. So um, I just wanted to one, um, just you know thank everybody for being here. I think that's one of the first big steps is just wanting to step outside of yourself to see some type of change or just to try to do something different within yourself, your community, your family. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. 
um, first off. Um, the second thing, all the panel people, you guys are so amazing. Um, I loved hearing you guys' stories. I love hearing what was going on, what you've been doing. That was truly inspiring as well. And for me, um, I kind of, again, I have a bunch of notes here. I was just listening to the whole thing for an hour, like no video on, just <laughs> ready to chime in, but um, being told to just wait, just wait, we'll let you go at the end. So if you guys do have a few more minutes besides the 5.30, I think I might go a little over, Corey, so please bear with me. Because I wanted to answer some of the questions that personally I felt as a black man, I think I could answer in some, in, in, inside of this um, chat box. And I was gonna start off with Miss Janeth. Um, let me see, I'm gonna scroll back up. So please bear with me, you guys. Ms. Janet had a really good question. Um, and if you could find the question before me, I'm going in chronological order. Um, she said something in regards to how do we discuss this with people? I don't see it anywhere. Oh. Okay, wait, hold on. Her question was, how do you bring this subject up to those who have never been marginalized and may not believe that this is a serious matter um, and that this is happening? And then the other side is, how do we bring solutions in these problems to youth today? Um, one of the big things, and I'm gonna tie her question into a question with um, Peyton. Peyton has said, how do we talk to somebody who's being super defensive? One of the biggest things that I've learned, like personally through my life, and especially after I got into college is, you can't argue with a tree. Um, because it's already stuck in like the roots that it's had, that it's grown. Of course, it can grow new fruit and bear and things like that. But we we can't come um, at somebody that we love or that we want to talk to in like a heightened argumentative way. Um, I think also um, Kelsey was kind of chiming on that as well. We we it, it it is our job to want to you know produce positive change, but we can't come at people in like a negative manner. So if they don't want to listen. Um, I think that's something I will agree with or disagree with you, Kelsey. It's, um, I, I'm not gonna argue with someone who doesn't wanna listen. I'll put forth information and knowledge to say, well, maybe you should check this out, but if they don't wanna listen or they aren't interested, um, I, I'm more so like, I wanna help people who want to, to, to see um, people of color flourish in this country. So you gotta kinda take that at your own like risk. Like, how do you want to approach something? Are they being argumentative and they're super defensive where they're cussing at me and arguing? You, you don't ever wanna be in those type of situations because nothing is gonna go right. Um, I don't know how many arguments, you, you know, you can get into with someone where they're talking bad to you like that. So just, just don't get into those type of situations. Um, another question I was gonna go over was Chloe. She had wrote on her question about should she put that she's worked with Black Lives Matter on an application, would that be biased? Of course. You, <laughs> I, I, the, the, the only problem with that, I think, is if the manager is someone who doesn't support that, I don't think you should put that. Maybe just put you've worked with an organization to help your community. Maybe just wording it a little different might be um, helpful, Chloe. I just wanted to really chime in on that one. Um, don't take away that you've helped, but maybe just wording it a little different only because for some reason, which is beyond me, um, the words Black Lives Matter have become political. <laughs> so um, not everybody's gonna quite see it, um, how you can see it through your lens or how I or other people of color see it. So you might just wanna label it something um, different personally. Um, I'm sorry guys, please bear with me. I'm sorry, I, I was literally sitting back for an hour just trying to answer all these questions and writing them down. Um, there was, Oh, sorry, to finish, um, somebody else said, how do we bring solutions to the youth? I would say books. Representation absolutely matters. So the type of books they're reading, the type of things, um, like having Black speakers come in, you know, um, I don't like the construct of just um, celebrating Black people or talking about people of color on Black History Month or, or a holiday. Um, during your whole school year, you should be planning to maybe introduce somebody new every single week or something, highlighting somebody that you find inspiring. Um, but representation, is, it's, it's so important when trying to speak to um, youth or, or just younger, younger students. Um, that could be truly helpful in, in what you're trying to do. Maybe like reading different books yourself to just be more knowledgeable on how you can help. Um, okay, Peyton's question, last one. Um, so another thing I was gonna say that, that one of the biggest things that I was writing down is that 
Um, learning can't really exist until we're willing to go like beyond ourselves. Um, we're, we're not a ever gonna be able to like understand somebody's plight or their situation until we can like um, have empathy for them to have awareness to what they're experiencing and, and clarity and understanding. But one of the most important parts of communication is listening. And, and although it's taken me five years with my wife to really grasp that, <laughs> that part of just listening, like it's hard, but that's one of the biggest things literally in communication. If we just literally can just sit back and understand, or, or if we can't understand, but just try to listen to what um, people of color are trying to tell us. So um, it doesn't have to happen to you for it to, to, to matter to you. And again, that chimes me back to I'm looking at, you know, the the gallery view and I'm seeing all these these beautiful people and I'm just like so appreciative to to see this. I'm, I'm going to even chime on what um, Letitia, am I saying that name right, Letitia, please? Okay, don't want to butcher your name, Queen. Um, she was speaking about um, Miss Angelica's question with like, as a woman of color, is it her job to be, you know, telling everybody what they should do, what they should read? And personally, um, Miss Angelica, I just wanted to say, um, it's not your job. You're not getting paid to to be out here telling people what they should read or what they should be doing. But as Leticia said, it's important to, you know, pick and choose kind of like what you feel you have the mental capacity to do. But protecting your peace, protecting your mind is like probably the most important thing you can honestly do as a, as a woman of color. You don't want to be sitting here, you know, I'm exhausted. I'm not going to lie. The, the last, um, what is it? Five months. I think I kind of really had a mental breakdown when, um, like going to get counseling after, um, Amari, Ahmad Arbery, after he was shot and killed in, in Georgia, that to me, um, that was the straw on the camel's back for me. Like, I, of course, I've been seeing all these other things going on and, you know, having to stop myself from speaking about it or talking about it much. But when that happened to um, Ahmad, that, that, was the, that, was the, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Then to see George Floyd, it, it, it's just been really hard for me to try to figure out how I can be valuable or, or open, you know what I mean? Like in this, in this, this time, so for most people of color, we've been trying to tell people like what's been going on or what we're experiencing. And we're usually getting like neglected or pushed to the side. Like that's not real. That's look at these facts, look at these facts. Um, and at times that, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of unfair because we're sitting here just really trying to explain our situation and we're being like stopped with these, these facts that are usually my opinion or cherry picked to fit a certain narrative to, make you feel like what you're going through is less than. Um, but one, all of the people of color, I wanted to especially tell you guys like, you're important, you matter. And then, and then the white people in this conversation, you're amazing, literally. Like, I appreciate what you guys are doing by just taking this first step to try to understand what can I do to help or what can I do to be better? So I just wanted to kind of leave you guys with like some of the best things, I, I've already kind of mentioned it, but the best things to help, um, you know, people of color, black people is, buying black like like as far as like if you can you can literally go on instagram and look up like a type of lotion if you use a lotion and you want to support a type of person who is, is whose color and you're like okay i want to buy some of their products i want to buy some of the things they do i'm going to buy clothes from a certain designer who is um native american there's all types of things you can do to show support um again representation matters if you're in your home um i love you too miss louise i just wanted to make sure i answered your questions you are welcome um in your home, you could be buying books. Like it, a lot of that, like a, what a lot of people don't understand is that how big representation like honestly matters. Like my son is only three years old, but to see like, um, we went to go see that Spider-Man movie and now he just can't stop jumping on the dang walls. Um, but, but the fact that, you know, he sees this superhero and he's like, I want to be like this guy or, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't think black people one have to be exceptional 4.0 GPA, all of these type of things in order to feel represented or accepted. And it's your job as, as people, again, we're all in like the same, we're all in the same boat. Like it's just our job as people to be loving, to be accepting, to be understanding, and, and again, listen. Um, and you can do all of those type of things, honestly, by just supporting your friends, people in your community. And 
that's honestly the best thing I can, you know, offer. Just literally listening and, and helping those. Thank you, Corey. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Xavier, for those amazing words. Just having this conversation is a step in the right direction. And we thank you for being here. We appreciate all of the panelists for having this conversation with us and for giving power to their voice and to others' voices. And we really do hope that we will see you again and have you back here to talk with us. Thank you everybody for joining us and we will see you at the next Power of Voice panel. <laughs>